are special to us, and we are uh, honored that you would spend your morning with us. The first psalm starts out this way. Blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked or stand in the way that sinners take or sit in the company of mockers, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord and who meditates on his law day and night. That person is like a tree planted by streams of water which yields its fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither, whatever they do prospers. This psalm sets out two clear different ways. It's a clear contrast. On the one hand, there's those who are walking with the wicked and standing with sinners and sitting with mockers. And on the other hand, there are those who delight in God's word and who meditate on it day and night. One way leads to destruction, one way leads to flourishing. The destructive way features a lot of verbs that we understand. Walking and standing and sitting. We know what those look like. We do them every day. We check our step count. We have watches that tell us if we've been sitting down too long and guilt us into standing up. All those words are signs of activity, and we understand those. The way that leads to flourishing seems a little cloudier. Meditate. What does that mean? What does the psalmist have in mind by meditating on God's word? What do you picture when you think of that? Is it a person who's sitting in the lotus position with hands in prayer and humming or chanting something? Is it someone listening to a perfectly calibrated podcast designed to sleep you? that. Maybe it's someone at breakfast positioning their Bible and coffee cup just perfectly in the frame for the perfect Instagram photo. What does the psalmist have in mind by a person who meditates on Scripture? What would it look like for us to meditate on Scripture? So in this series on spiritual practices, that's what we're going to talk about today. We've talked about praying and fasting and silence and solitude. We've talked about service. Being in Scripture is a key spiritual practice. And there are different ways to be in Scripture. We could talk about multiple ways to be in Scripture. We're going to talk about meditating on God's Word today. What does that mean and what does the psalmist have in mind? Well, if you go to the book of Joshua, we get a similar passage with similar wording where God is talking to a new leader, Joshua. So Moses has died, and now Joshua is in charge of God's people. And among the instructions that God gives Joshua as he takes on this new leadership role are these words. Keep this book of the law always on your lips. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. So there's the word meditate again. The Hebrew word is hagah, and it means to chew or ruminate on, stew on. It even gets used in passages where someone is hatching a plot. It's kind of this, this little thing. We're, we're thinking it through. And I want to focus on the word chew. Now, I, you may be like me. I notice sometimes I eat way too fast. I just bite after bite and shovel it down. I love what I'm eating and I want more of it. And so I chew quickly. It's just a way to get through the meal. But about a week and a half ago, um, my daughter Mariah was out of school a little early during finals week. And so we, we were going to have a lunch to celebrate a successful school year. And not everyone in our family loves seafood, but we enjoy seafood. So we went to eat seafood. Now, I'm always very careful to plug restaurants by name, so I'm not going to do that. I'll just tell you that it was a seafood restaurant on Lover's Lane, okay? We go in and see a church member there say hello and sit down, and we're greeted by our waiter whose name, I don't know what his real name is, but he said they call him Catfish. And I figure if that's your waiter name at a seafood restaurant, I'm going to trust you. And he's going over the menu with us, 
and telling us what we should try our first time there. And I'm telling you, it might have been one of my top 10 meal experiences. It was great. And everything we tried. I won't go into detail because I'm the thing standing between you and lunch. So I'm not going to make you hungry by telling you what we ate. But it was wonderful. And I found myself savoring each bite. It's like each one was better than the last one. And everything was, the flavors were wonderful. It's just the perfect meal. And I remembered, like, this is what it's like to slowly chew and savor a meal. Not just shovel it down, but chewing on it carefully and thoughtfully and soaking it in. The word shows up again in the book of Isaiah where Isaiah pictures God as a lion who growls over its prey. Or sometimes it's in simpler terms, like the psalmist who says, at night, I think of you. Same wording. I think of you. Okay, that's great. So meditating, growl, ruminating, that's a mental state. What then does that look like? How would I practice this? Well, you may know one of the famous passages in Deuteronomy where People are given instructions for how to pass down teaching. And then we start to get more tangible when we see this. Deuteronomy chapter 6, after the passage of love God with your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and keep these commandments, these are then the instructions that the people of Israel get. Impress them, that's the commandments, on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. So now it's impress them on your children. It's literally the word for pierce and sharpen. We're getting tangible here. We're getting real. Talk about them. Tie them. Write them. So meditating on scripture, it's not just some activity to calm us and center us. It's an activity that shapes our whole life. And so each week as we've looked at these passages, we've seen how they're used in various parts of Scripture, but what we really do is watch how Jesus teaches them and how Jesus practices them because ultimately all that we do is in service of becoming more like Jesus. In Matthew 4, Jesus both teaches this and practices it. In response to a temptation from the devil, Jesus says that we don't live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. This is our food. We literally chew on it like we would chew our food. It is our sustenance. It gives us life, more even than the bread we eat each day. And this response is in the midst of three responses that Jesus gives. So He's out in the wilderness, he's being tempted, and three times the devil tempts him, and all three times Jesus' response, his resistance, is straight from Scripture. So the devil says, tell the stones to become bread, and Jesus says, we don't live on bread alone, but by God's word. And the devil says, throw yourself down from the highest point, and Jesus responds by quoting Deuteronomy, don't test God. And the devil says, worship me and I'll give you the whole world. And Jesus quotes Deuteronomy and says, we should worship and serve God only. Jesus has meditated on and internalized scripture so much that it is his ready response to temptation. Now, Jesus could have academically picked apart Satan's exegesis. He could have said, well, that passage is used in an incorrect way and let me give you five arguments against it. Or maybe Jesus could have gotten into a tense public discussion and dropped some spicy takes in response and been snarky and rude at the misuse of Scripture. But that's not true. He had internalized it so much that it was a calm, ready response to things that got thrown at him. So what I'm I'm wanting to articulate this morning is that this practice looks a little bit different than studying the Bible. We, we know what Bible study looks like. And it, by the way, it's a very good practice that serves us well. Just so we're clear up front, I'm not saying that we replace one with the other. I'm saying that we have a holistic way of engaging Scripture and that we 
do our Bible study, but we meditate on it as well. There is a difference between studying scripture, like we would use that word, and meditating on it. So for me, for instance, I I am trained, just like you are in your discipline, I'm trained to study scripture academically and read it critically and do exegetical work. And I'm very grateful for that training. It, It has served me well, but it has its limits. And when you're trained that way, it can sometimes become difficult to read devotionally. It's the same way lawyers can't just skim a document and say, that looks good as written. You know it's true. You're trained through your lens to look for ways to engage it with your training. I understand that. And I'm not even talking about all of us who have Bible degrees or not. We may be steeped in Scripture, and we, we know how to read it informationally. Thank you for doing that, by the way. I'm glad that we want to do that. But sometimes I can fall into a pattern of just reading for sermon prep or reading back in my academic days to write a paper, and it can be hard to switch into devotional mode. Now, there is the opposite problem of just reading devotionally that has Uh, no basis in the truth of scripture we can proof text we can make memes that irresponsibly engage scripture i've taught courses before at the college level trying to help people understand this is what that passage probably means and it's probably not a good idea to use it that way so you know passages like god won't give you more than you can handle and we know how that gets used and misused so just reading that devotionally can be a problem I certainly don't think we have a crisis of too much biblical literacy. So I'm glad to to read it and engage it that way. But reading scripture informationally is not enough. You can exegete a passage and then go be a jerk to your family. Or maybe that's just me. See, I think we know how to chew and ruminate. We know how to pace around. We know how to doom surf the web, we know how to lie awake and have anger fantasies about that conversation we really want to have with that person. We know what it's like to chew and ruminate and stew on things. And I'm just suggesting what would happen if we did that with Scripture. So when Jesus was tempted because of his deep rootedness in Scripture, in Deuteronomy, no less, Jesus was able to calmly and matter-of-factly resist temptation. I want to give you now one way to do that. What would, what would a meditative reading look like that supplements maybe more informational reading of Scripture? There is a practice that many of you have heard of. The Latin name for it is Lectio Divina. The plain wording is sacred reading. It's been around since the 4th century. And a, a resource that's really helpful, a contemporary resource is Eugene Peterson's Eat This Book. That's the name of his his book, Eat This Book. I want to read you a few quotes from his book about this way of reading Scripture and then show you what it might look like. Peterson said this way of reading Scripture is a way that guards against depersonalizing the text into an affair of questions and answers, definitions and dogmas. A way of reading that prevents us from turning Scripture on its head and using it to justify ourselves. It's a way of reading that intends the fusion of the entire biblical story and my story. And it's a way of reading that refuses to be reduced to just reading, but intends the living of the text, listening and responding to the voices of that great cloud of witnesses, telling their stories, singing their songs, preaching their sermons, praying their prayers, asking their questions, having their children, burying their dead, and following Jesus. That sounds like a great practice, doesn't it? A holistic reading of Scripture. How do we do it? What might a process look like? And again, some of you, this is just a review. Some of you, this might be new, and it's okay. There's really four steps in this way of reading Scripture. The first step is just to read. 
But instead of reading a lot, which I normally recommend, I like reading chapters at a time verse, instead of verses at a time to get context. But for this way of reading, I'm just going to read a few verses, most, slowly, aloud, if possible, even if I'm alone, and I'm going to read them through two or three times. I'm not going to be in a hurry. So that's step one, read. Step two is to meditate. But this isn't just silent humming. This is to consider a word or a phrase that jumps out at me after reading two or three times. Is there a, an important character trait that I see in the passage? Is there a quality of God? Is there something God does that I need to ask God to do for me in this passage? And I'm just going to consider this word or phrase and chew on it and ask myself, what might God be saying to me through this verse and even this word? And step three is to pray. And what I'm going to do here is pray this word back to God and ask God to teach me something. Ask God to do something. Ask God to shape me. And the fourth step is just to rest. Instead of hurrying into whatever's next on my list, instead of getting on with my schedule, I'm just going to take a moment to rest and process and to slowly re-enter my world and my space. This is just one way to do it, but it has been a quite widely used way to do it. And it's a way to let scripture seep into us. It's a way to chew on it beyond just moving past. I mean, I'm doing one of those read the Bible through in a year plans. I'm grateful for it, but I'm moving pretty quickly through it. And some days I'm just reading it to say I've read it. And I'm not saying that's the best way, but I am trying to get through it in a year like many of you do. And let's be honest, not 365 out of 365 days am I feeling deeply impacted by reading for 15 minutes. Sometimes I'm in a hurry. This way combats that by focusing me on just a verse or two. So could we just take a, a minute or two, and maybe in a, in a more rapid pace, I just want to walk through what this might look like together. Now, if we were in a small group, we would actually be interactive, and we could talk back and forth. We won't do that today, but just for a moment, let's do a sacred reading of Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. To hear these words from God. For the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. I'll read it again for us. For the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword, it penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Now I just want to invite you for a few seconds to consider a word or phrase that you heard, and the scripture will be on the screen as well, a word or phrase in this passage that stuck out to you. We were in a small group, I'd ask you to say it to me, but here I'll just let you consider it to yourself. And now I invite you just to pray it back to God briefly. What's the word or phrase that you noticed? And how might you pray it to God? We'll just take a moment together to rest, be thankful. Now, if you were to do this on your own or with a small group of others, you would take more time than we just took. You might plan on five, six, seven minutes at the minimum. And you can pick any passage you want. 
keep it small, and make it a meaningful time rather than something that you need to hurry through. If you're interested in doing this more, I again would commend to you Peterson's book, Eat This Book. Uh, If you are a person who likes to do these things on an app, there's an app called Dwell that some of you may have heard of, which has lots of different features on engaging scripture, but one of them is sort of meditative readings uh, that if you like to tune things out and you want to hear it, by the way, there's lots of things in scripture about hearing the word of God, so hearing it is just as blessed as reading it, and if that's how you engage scripture best, then you should go for it. I'll just close by asking you to imagine what life would look like. Imagine a life that deeply reflects on, that chews on Scripture. It would be a life where when someone gets in your face, you've chewed on the passage about being angry but not sinning. And so you maintain a calm demeanor and you don't say things that you regret. It's a life... When the doctor speaks the diagnosis out loud to you, you have meditated on the passage about not worrying, but turning your concerns over to God, and you don't feel abandoned. Or when a person you love embraces a candidate you hate, you've growled over passages about giving a gentle answer, and so you don't ruin a friendship. When your grown child rejects all that you've taught him or her. You've reflected on the story of the prodigal son and you hold on to hope. And finally, it's a life where when the bottom falls out, you've chewed on the story of the resurrection and you know that the best is yet to come. May we live lives that meditate on, chew on the word of God. Let's be standing.